Bob Nardelli, the former CEO of Home Depot, is now on a speaking tour. He gives uh, workshops and seminars on how you can succeed, how you can be a better business person, or just a better person. In one of his talks, he gave this analogy. Every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up. It knows it must run faster than the fastest lion or it will be killed. Every morning, a lion wakes up. It knows it must outrun the slowest gazelle or it will starve to death. It doesn't matter whether you are a lion or a gazelle. When the sun comes up, you'd better be running. <laughs> Those are good words of advice. 2,000 years ago, the sun came up on this first Easter morning. And if you follow along in the sermon notes insert, we have reprinted a, an account of a very early morning race. Here are three people, and they are on the move. <coughs> on the move. What's the motivation? I mean, what compelled three people to move quickly to, of all places, a cemetery? A and what was the result or the conclusion to their morning run? John, the author of the Gospel, mentions three people who play an important role in the Easter story. Three people. They show up for the first Easter morning service. And as we study scripture this morning, I think you will see that the lesson here relates to 21st century Christianity. There's something here for us. Maybe we will see ourselves in this early morning run. Well, the first individual that we will meet this morning is the author of the gospel, the Apostle John, and in his very own words, he describes the moment, beginning with verse number three. Peter and the other disciples started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped in and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. The other disciple, that's John, didn't go in. The stone had been rolled away. I mean, he has easy access to the tomb, but John decides he will not enter. It isn't until Peter arrives behind him and Peter enters the tomb that John finally takes another step. Verse number eight, it says, then the disciple who had reached the tomb first, that's John, also went in and he saw and he believed. When I read this, I find John to be a compelling figure. When he receives this amazing message from Mary, Mary said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. When John gets this message, it says that he runs. I mean, full speed ahead. I mean, he passes Peter, and there he is. He makes it to the tomb first. He stands in the entrance, and then he's content just to peek in. Don't you find that amazing? He won the race. Now, I suspect he's a little out of breath, but he's young, he's strong. My goodness, he could certainly walk a couple more steps. But for some reason, John pulls up short. He's content just to stoop in, look in. It reads like John is lacking the courage to take a couple of extra steps into a glorious reality. 
It's the Sunday before Easter. The Sunday school teacher for the kindergarten class asked her children if they knew what happened on Easter and why it was so important. Well, one little girl raised her hand. Yes, Jenny? Easter is when the whole family gets together and you eat turkey and sing about the pilgrims and all that. <laughs> no, that's not quite right. Little Johnny raises his hand. I know what Easter is. Easter is when you get a tree and decorate it and give gifts to everybody and you sing lots of songs. No, that's not it either. A third student speaks up. Easter is when Jesus was killed, put in a tomb, and left for three days. The teacher's relieved. Finally, someone knows about Easter. And then she continues. Then everybody gathers at the tomb and waits to see if Jesus comes out. And if he sees a shadow, he has to go back inside for six more weeks of winter. Oh my. But friends, let me tell you, this is the kind of world we live in. There are so many who are not in church on Easter morning. And they really believe Easter is all about a bunny and eggs. They haven't got a clue. The Apostle John ran to the tomb. He doesn't know what to expect. And when he arrives, he's speechless. I mean, he is stunned. His goal on Easter morning was to hurry to the tomb of Jesus. He wins the race, and he's now facing something that is absolutely astounding. I mean, this is almost too good to be true. Maybe that's the problem in 2017. People approach the resurrection story. They read about this event. They hear it preached. We sing about it. An absolutely amazing event. A risen Savior. Death has been defeated. We can now live a life and no salvation. It's a message that it just takes your breath away. And some people, they... they shake their head, they say, nah, that's just too good to be true. Preacher, that's a fairy tale. This morning, the challenge is to take a few more steps forward and step in and believe. The second individual uh, that we read about is Peter. Now, I'm reading beginning with verse 3. It says, Peter and the other disciples started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped in and looked in, saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Now, Peter, he may have lost the race to the tomb, but when he arrives, he wastes no time. It says that Simon Peter arrived and he went inside. No hesitation. And we know a little bit about Peter. He was impulsive. Uh, he was fearless. That's our Peter. He arrived and went inside. Hey, the final game ever played at the Joe Louis Arena took place last Sunday. Our Detroit Red Wings played the New Jersey Devils, and they won 4-1. to one. Now, I watched some of that game on TV. It was almost like a Stanley Cup Finals game. Uh, the fans were cheering, and the Wings were playing like champions. When the final seconds ticked down on that game and it was all over, an octopus, octopus go, goes flying from the stands onto the ice and suddenly the red light is blasting away and surrounding the crowds and, and they began to sing Old Lang Syne. It was a nice way to end the season. 
but it doesn't change the fact that our Detroit Red Wings, after 25 consecutive seasons, will not be in the playoffs. It's not the way the players wanted the season to end. It's not the way the fans wanted the season to end. Take heart. On September the 1st, 2017, it's a Friday, the Wings will be playing their first game in the new Little Caesars Arena. Here's a quote from one fan. The new place is new hope, a new adventure. We got a brand new team coming. New young guys, the streak has died with the Joe. Let's start a new streak. <laughs> Don't you love optimism? And I think this is exactly what Peter would have said on the first Easter morning. Hmm. If he'd been a Red Wing and at the game, he would have been saying this to the mountaintops, declaring it to the world. But here we have Peter arriving at the tomb. He looks at John. He looks inside the tomb. And then he steps in. And maybe he was thinking, boy, Friday was a terrible day. I watched them crucify my Jesus. I thought it was all over. This is not how I thought it would end. But now, something amazing has happened. It's the beginning of something new. New hope, new energy, a new adventure. Hmm. Peter may have been second in the foot race, but at that moment, this guy was the winner. I mean, this is impulsive Peter. Sometimes he's reckless. Nothing will stand in his way in getting to the bottom of something. He wants fact. <clears throat> On this Easter morning, I could just see Peter pushing John aside and, and going into the tomb. And you know what? At that very moment, I think God was pleased. I think he smiled. That's what he wants. He wants believers who hear about Jesus and the resurrection story and nothing will stop them. He wants people who are bold and who will speak out and rejoice and be happy in their faith. He wants someone who's not afraid. Not afraid what others might think. If that's you, You'll, experiencing, you'll experience something amazing. This brings us now to the third person in our story, Mary Magdalene. In John chapter 20, beginning in verse 1, it reads, Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, remember that's John, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Austin Miles attended the University of Pennsylvania and he graduated from Philadelphia College of Pharmacy. He was enjoying some success. He was only 25 years old, and he was a successful pharmacist. And then he found something that was even more satisfying. He quit his job as a pharmacist, and he declared to his family and the world, I'm going to write gospel music. In the span of almost 50 years, he had published 446 hymns. Some of them might be familiar to you. Dwelling in Beulah Land. A New Name and Glory. All Alone. But he's best remembered for something he wrote in 1912. Now this is the story behind the hymn. One day in April 1912, I was seated in the dark room 
where I kept my photographic equipment and also my organ. I drew my Bible toward me and it opened at my favorite book and chapter, John chapter 20. I don't know if this is by chance or by the work of the Holy Spirit. It was though I was in a trance. As I read it that day, it seemed to be part of the scene. I became a silent witness to that dramatic moment when Mary, when she knelt bef before our Lord and cried out, Rabboni, which means teacher. I rested my hand on my open Bible. I stared at the light blue wall, and as the light faded, I seemed to be standing at the entrance of a garden, looking down a gently winding path shaded by olive branches. There was a woman in white with her head bowed, hand clasping her throat, as if to choke back her sobs, walking slowly into the shadows. It was Mary. As she came unto the tomb upon which she placed her hand, she bent over to look in and ran away. John, in a flowing robe, appeared looking at the tomb. Then came Peter, who entered the tomb, followed slowly by John. As they departed, Mary reappeared, leaning her head upon her arm at the tomb. And I watched as she wept. Turning herself, she saw Jesus standing there. So did I. I knew it was he. She knelt before him with arms outstretched and looked into his face and cried, Rabboni. I awakened in sunlight, gripping my Bible with my muscles tense and nerves vibrating under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I wrote as quickly as the words could be formed, the lyrics exactly as it's sung today. That same evening, I wrote the tune and we just sang that glorious tune just as it was written in 1912. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. That's beautiful imagery. There's Mary meeting Jesus on that first Easter morning. Here's how John records the event. Beginning with verse 11, he writes, Mary was standing outside the tomb crying. She wept. She stooped in, looked in. She saw two white, white-robed angels, one sitting at the head, the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked. Because they have taken my Lord I don't know where they put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus. But she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go get him. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't ascended to the Father, but go find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. Then she gave them his message. Of the three people we looked at this morning, the three who rushed to the tomb, Mary is the one I admire the most. I mean, she was the first one to visit the tomb. She was the first one to shed tears of sorrow, and then suddenly the tears of sorrow turned to tears of joy. She, she was the first. And of all of our Sunday worship services, it's Easter that has more people coming to church than any other day, more than any other Sunday. 
Do you know what I think? I think people come to church on Easter because they really, deep down, want to experience something that's real. They want a private moment of revelation. And I believe they come praying that something will happen, that they will have that, that special private time. Well, this morning we looked at the conclusion of that first Easter morning. We looked at three individuals, didn't we? We looked at John and he peeks into the, to the tomb and he's timid and only takes a few steps. We saw Peter, he rushed in, he was bold and, and he moved then to tell others and then we read about Mary meeting the Savior. I wonder, how is this Easter morning going to end for you? I, I, I pray that it will be a true day today. It'll be a revelation day. It'll be a supernatural experience. I pray that God's Holy Spirit will touch your heart. Amen.